So suppose I'm going to write a script. Uh, in this, at this point, I'll just call it a. Uh, I'll just echo script to fix or to. Uh, I'll just call it the freeze setHC that exe. And what I would do is I would the only thing the script would do, regardless of whether it got changed or not, I might have. Let's suppose I have it kept in some special location. I would just do something like this, copy, uh, C, uh, frozen, set hc.exe to the system root, which is a, usually it's the C drive, but just to be sure it uses the, whatever the current system root is, slash Windows system 32. And the reason I know about this system root is in the command prompt, if I do a set, it shows me all the system variables, our environment variables, and there I see, oh, system root is set to be C colon Windows. I don't think there's a Windows 32 anywhere there, or system 32. Oh, there it is. Path. Oh, that, that's sorry. That's the path. It's system 32 is part of the standard path. This is the closest I get to a, a, a generic variable for where the system location is, which is usually going to be C Windows. How did you get there in? I just did a set. Just run the program set, and it shows you what your current environment variables are. You can also go to advanced system settings environment variables, but uh, I learned this first in, in Linux. Um, and then they, I realized it was also a command. I'll just do a set. Shows you all your system variables. So I see that system root is the variable, and I can use percentages around variables for it to access then the environment value of that variable. So I could just assume that I'm keeping my frozen versions of things over here, and if I had other other files that I suspect might be altered. I could just keep this, keep keep the frozen versions of, of these. Now, of course, anyone, any attacker that knows I'm running this kind of script could could know to go mess with these files, and of course, they've defeated my uh, prevention of it. But programs can can try to hide where they're keeping their versions. It could be an, an encrypted file, a, an archive, uh, and unless they can disable my script my script will always succeed. So let's go ahead and save this as a script. And I'll just put it in, well, since I need to run it as a script, I'm going to make sure to save it somewhere where it can be publicly accessible by the system when they're logging in. And generally, users other than public are not accessible by the system because of the access account control that they like to put in. So I'm going to throw this over in the public folder and I'll just save it over there in the public documents. If I even want to have a folder called strips, scripts I can save it. So I'm going to save that as uh, freeze setHC.bat. So I can save that as a batch file and click save. And let's just go see that that file is over there. I go look to my C drive, users, public documents, and there it is. I turn on the view of my file name extensions. Batch files automatically will can run as just commands that I run. Oh, and this will echo that to this to the screen if it's running as a as a process. So a simple thing to replace the set HC. But I haven't implemented yet. Here's how easy it would be to implement that. I go over here to schedule tasks. Oops. Start. Schedule tasks. Uh, I, is that a new there's a C in there. Yeah. 
Oh, oh you're right. Uh, yeah, I'm assuming that my frozen stuff is on the C drive, and I'm setting. Oh, and I got a typo in there. Settings. So this would be the script that would save it. I'll go ahead and do a brief paste of that. Now, to actually get this to run at login, look how easy it is. And this is a something that uh, is really scary. Once you start looking at your task scheduler, and I'll enlarge this because I know I'm going to see a large list. In the task scheduler, if I looked at, at my library of scheduled tasks, I realize how many scheduled tasks there are that have been installed by all the various programs I've installed. And it's kind of kind of makes me nervous if I expand this. One, look how many tasks OneDrive installs when I have OneDrive working. And I think that comes with Windows. And actually, it's not as long as this as I saw on my other computer or my laptop at home because I've been doing some installs. Google automatically installs some scheduled tasks. Edge has some scheduled tasks. You wonder which of these will try to try to set Edge as a default browser again. But we can make our own. Watch what we can do with making a scheduled task. And remember where our task is. It's over that, that little SetHC program. I can go over here to uh, create basic task. Give it a name. I'll call it uh, freeze SetHC. And I'll just put a little description in here. Uh, prevent the set hc.exe at. And I'm going to have it. Here's the key. I can have it run when the computer starts. And I click next. And I will start a program. And I browse to that script that I just created over there on the C drive. Users public. Set AC. No arguments needed. If I were dependent on it needing to be in a particular place when it ran, I could have it start in that same location. And I'll do that just in case I'm going to refer to some configuration files or something in the, in the script. I could have it start in that same location if it wanted to look for other files of, say, a list of other files that I want to freeze. But it's really not needed for this one since the task is pretty much standalone. Do one command and quit. And then I click Next. And my program now will run when this, whenever the system is restarted. Now at this point, I do not have a frozen folder, so that folder would, would need to exist, or this program is just going to error out because this, this file does not exist. But suppose it did, that script actually will run. And this is actually a real way of perhaps preventing something like a rootkit. Now I don't have antivirus installed, I would expect if I installed antivirus of any time, that there would be something set to run the antivirus program while the system starts up. And there may be other mechanisms in the task scheduler, but this is a real easy way. I can always go to properties of that and see that that task is set. Oh, I'll run, oh I, I need to have it run with highest privileges. Uh, I can decide what user it's running as, and I could even have it run as administrator instead of running as me, the person that created the script. And I can check to have it run whether logged in or not. And I, ooh, look at that, I can hide it. I haven't messed with hidden. I'm not sure if that works with that. I think that means when it's hidden that that black command prompt won't show. Have you ever booted up and saw a bunch of black command prompts pop up and disappear? I believe those are startup tasks enabled. So I can elevate my privileges. I would need the, the admin passwords if I want to have this run as admin. I can choose a, the, admin, the administrator user to run, but I know I'm administrator, so I, I'm okay with that. But uh, this 
will allow me to prevent that uh, that attack. And I can look at my triggers and see it's set to run on startup. Other actions I can do with that, there's the program that's going to start. Let's see, conditions. If I needed network access, I could set it to only start if the network connection is working. Other settings, oh, I could allow it to be run anytime. If I'm ever suspected, I could go to schedule task. Because over here in schedule task, you can right click on any task and say, oh, run it, by the way. I'm, I'm in, I want that to run. You could actually manually kick off tasks. So that task scheduler is one primary place. When, I remember one, once having a virus, it was it was just filling the task scheduler with gobs and gobs of you know, running itself. Um, and that was one indicator that we had a virus. And we, I would, when those were happening, I would commonly check task scheduler and see are there any mysterious tasks being implemented. And that's where I discovered that, yeah, when you install software, they install scheduled tasks to update themselves, your typical update. This is the, I will, I will call this the working, using this, the system mechanism to update your software. Other viruses will bypass this if they find a way and fool the system into running their tasks. Because anyone can come and watch and look at scheduled tasks and say, hey, wait a minute, I don't want that happening, and, and disable them. And that was one manual in mitigation of a virus. You would. First thing you do, go to your scheduled task, or disable the task scheduler, and then go to, go to your task scheduler library and clear out all these randomly named tasks. Of course, I never trust manually removing antiviruses because I know I'm gonna miss something. And it you know, depends on me, not with human error, missing something. But that task scheduler is a pretty powerful way to implement something that you can run at the start of the system just like an antivirus kicks in at the start. So that's just one. But now you know task scheduler mechanism, creating the script, but of course, rather than doing it all manually, you could buy software. And did you find something? I think there's more than just the uh, deep freeze. PC, typically I look for a PC deep freeze alternatives. SourceForge has uh, tons of listing of alternatives, or there's alternatives.net. If there was something I wasn't happy about Deep Freeze, I could find all my options here. Let's see if this get, oh, there's the SourceForge link. And what do we find for alternatives? Uh, lockdown USBs. I'm not seeing actual. Unwanted changes, Shadow Defender, that looks like there's a tool with time freeze. So multiple versions. I'm not sure if there is a, uh, a open source or free version. But this is one way of defending. Now, what do you think the price? Let's see, I think the uh, this guy, I think was $50 a, a year. You get it's a $50 for one year's I think updates. I think I saw it was $65 for three years. Oh yeah, okay. So now we go back to the idea, what is the most practical defense? What are we willing to pay? So, sort of free if I do my own script. Is that secure enough? Just, but I think what you said at the very start is, ZHC is just one of several break-ins. Let's see if I can see if I can find other break-ins of this type because I know when I was looking at reviewing the ZHC and how it all worked to make sure I get, did it right. There's a sticky, sticky keys trick. They call it the sticky keys trick. Um, But I know Sticky Keys is no longer, it, it's not the only one. Let's 
see if they only mention the sticky keys. I know there's other ones that are similar that you get into you get into recovery mode and you can do just about anything. These guys recommend you know the recovery disc, but that re that requires you to have have it boot from the CD or or disk drive. Uh, these are all defeated sort of by putting a password on the BIOS and not allowing change of the boot order, but physical access can allow you to reset that. Uh, looks like they're only mentioning the, the ZHC hack. But back to this idea of how much is it worth? And this gets to our risk assessment. How much are we willing to spend? Is physical access a practical thing you can do on all PCs? Can you? Not everything. But what? So what do you do instead? Say you can't limit physical access. I mean, you could you could limit physical access to like a room. Yeah. So you have access to the room access, building access, security cameras, mm -hmm. all sorts of things to pr try to prevent that. But as the PCs get smaller or people get smarter. They may, even without walking out of the door with the PC, if they can get in and mess with it, then they're in. So suppose, suppose you go on the defense method, okay, we can't prevent physical access, we'll make it hard. Uh, so if they wanted to do this, they, it would take some time, like the BIOS password, limiting the boot up, because we know a boot from a CD or flash will let them in. How about the system software? Is it worth the deep freeze? What's the cost of that? It's more than just a $60 for three years. It's the installing of that, the hours for, for IT to install that, make sure it's updated, uh, verify that it's on. There's Plenty of cost that comes, even with buying software, just to make sure that it's installed and running. What's our, our, our one option is, well, we know we have this risk with Windows 11. We have a backup image in case we, we, we're hacked. Uh, the antivirus, I'd say, I'd say most people uh, would have an antivirus. I don't know if antivirus, though, detect changes to the system software like ZHC. I don't even know, maybe Windows Defender might defend against that. It would take some time for me to do a little research. What's the most practical prevention of the ZHC attack? Just for fun, let's do a little search online. I'll go bring up my search engine here and let's just look for prevent set hc exe attack it explains it and then what are the what are their answers prevent exclude from external media well that doesn't fix it completely lock it up they claim disk bit locker. Uh, I think that's actually true because bit, I think I think bit locker will make you type in your password when you start doing things like that. Does it? I guess I'd have to test it. Does it uh, affect the performance of my machine? For doing for doing bit locker? Yeah. No. I think. I think BitLocker it it like unlocks the drive when you log in, and then it works fine. So but it's not encrypting you, it so much. It, I mean, but there's it's, some I, encryption I think it's, happening. I think it's encrypting it. it I never noticed the performance change. Okay. But like the the danger with that is if you lose the BitLocker, right, key, then right. you have you lost everything. Yeah. 
Now, one thing they mentioned that you know you could you could replace set HC with more than just command prompt. The command prompt is pretty powerful, but you could replace that with anything. Uh, what this guy suggested, you know, you could have basically remote terminals into your systems, <laughs> or or VMs for your systems, and all you have are remote remote terminals into them. Does the cloud really? would a would a system in the cloud prevent this? I'm thinking it would. They wouldn't let you do the restart, get into into a troubleshoot mode as a normal user. So basically, prevents you from having physical access. That's where they mentioned you know, have thin clients. I I don't know because how does because how the remote access work with that? Would you still be able to have access to the server as it's booting up? Because if that's the case, there is some possibility. Yeah, it'd work. Yeah, you could have them running in the cloud, and you have a basically remote terminal into it to do your applications. And I, I think a lot of people are doing that. Even have a local uh, server with VMs. Now, here's a fairly practical thing: is basically turn off how the keyboard works, that it doesn't kick in sticky keys. So that would be a a system setting that doesn't let you into sticky keys doesn't prevent you from getting in to the uh, command prompt in troubleshooting mode and mess with the system. Uh, maybe I would bet there's probably a way to turn on sticky keys when, you, when you're in a, a troubleshooting mode, but that would take a little extra work. I, I, I would bet it's just a registry edit setting somewhere. And the thing is, if I can get in to troubleshooting mode, I don't know if troubleshooting mode will let you run a, access a USB drive and have a script that does all the fixing and just a USB drive that you mount and then run. But I don't think it'd be a huge number of commands to type in that would enable sticky keys and then do the setHC hack. So this all gets back to the, the idea of assessing the risk and the cost and how much are you willing to spend, how much time are you willing to spend and cost to prevent this attack because this is one attack among many here at Emmaus, we just know it's there, and I avoid telling people I don't trust about that hack, but it's on every Windows system. There was a guy that, uh, very smart guy, but he would do things without telling me. He, I, I don't know if I handed him my PC to look at something, and he found he knew some quick hack that he could get as administrator, and he did it on my PC. It's like, I didn't really, give you permission to do that and you're making me uncomfortable that you did that without asking me. And I, I sort of learned to trust him but that's some, kind of something, if you if you do find a hack, don't just say, hey, let me show you this. Say, hey, I have found this. I've done this on my PC or on my VM and by the way, that could happen to any of your PCs. Always do it on your own. Don't, don't uh, do it on somebody else's. Even if they're your friend, you're going to make them nervous and They'll, they'll respect you, but they may not quite trust you. So always, always ask permission. So that's that's your uh, constant uh, issues that you have to consider. As you know of certain weaknesses, think to yourself, what is the best mitigation? Is it uh, worth all that time? Or do you just resolve yourself, yeah, we know that's a risk, we have backups and we regularly uh, scan our system for those changes. Uh, is that enough? If you see it has been changed, you might just automatically kick in, oh, we, we uh, reinstalled the system. All right, let's go over some of the concepts here in chapter three uh, that I have just for going through the book. We're going to jump. We're going to jump more and more into the risk assessment part because we want to cover that. There's this book has a lot of chapters, and we I may be modifying our chapter numbers to get to the risk assessment parts of it. So here is here is the presentation for the rest of today. How do we know attack has happened? First of all, we have to know what attacks, what attacks are there. 
So here's what we just did with a with this setHC hack, sticky keys hack, lots of possibilities, and we have that detect it and mitigate it. So at, at the very least, you need to some somehow detect that this has happened. The easiest way is compare it to known signatures of what's in there. And I would want something in my system to detect changes to the system. I could check log files, but that's a time consuming thing as well. Hopefully there's an automatic check log files for the messages coming from my antivirus. In a system, because you can do so much damage as an administrator, and programs running with administrative privileges can do lots of damage if they are hacked, you never run or you avoid as much as possible running a, a system process in escalated privileges. Now this is something just coming out in Windows 11. This has been a thing in Linux for 20 years or more. You never, well, you avoid running as admin. You install the pro program, you give access control to the system, to the fi system files, and process to that pro particular process. That process owns specific important files, and the system side deals with those little files that are only changeable by that program. Like the Apache process on Linux, which is the, the web server, only the files that Apache needs to run have Apache ownership. And let me just show you that in uh, connecting to my server here. I'll use Putty. And I'll connect to my web server running Linux. This, the same concept applies to my buddy go? Why does the hide behind a window when I start it up? Go to people.mass.edu. Alternate port. And log in. And I'll <coughs> my font size here. I thought I had set that to be the default settings. Change my font. Nice and large. I'm going to apply it to my default settings. Okay. So over here under ls minus al of var www.html, root has ownership of a lot of things, but this particular folder that is storing data for the Moodle system is owned by Apache because there's reading and writing of those files by the Apache, by the web server, by the script that's running this ecs.mass.edu. I set that up to be a Moodle site just for fun. And because it, Apache needed to read and write, I gave Apache ownership. But Apache does not own and does not run as administrator. There are some things that Apache can do. It can read files. See, the, the read is set. I'm a little nervous that we have execute there. I'm not sure that should be executed. But this is where you give ownership to things to Apache and the process itself. Uh, maybe it's running as HTTP. Yeah, there's the server. It's running with only permissions of the Apache user. And I'll bet you if I look at the Let's look at the ownership of that, that program. Oh, it's owned by root. That's a little scary. Uh, but it, is, it does not have the SUID bit set that when it runs, it runs as root. But those are the things that Linux has had there forever. Under Windows, according to the book, 
Windows 11 has more uh, careful uh, control of permissions. Now another huge thing in terms of attacks and that they mentioned this chapter, they spend plenty of time on other scripts, but we want to make sure you have a really, really good understanding of SQL injection because it's uh, this concept of messing with input and fooling the code is everywhere besides, in many, many places besides SQL. We're only looking at the SQL example. Here is a SQL script that if I know I have code that has this script in it, I can take advantage of this thing right here. Let me turn on my little laser pointer so I know exactly what I'm talking about. Here is the vulnerability right here. I'm setting the variable uname. This is PHP, where variables all start with dollar signs. I'm setting the variable uname to be the value of whatever they typed in an input on a web form. Or actually, I could have even put it in the URL with a uh, question mark uname equals some value. So whatever was typed in that uname text box or on the URL will be set to be the value of the uname variable. Now, he, so uname can have something random in there, but the programmer thought, oh, they'll just be typing in a username. Maybe they'll put spaces in a name. Well, we'll watch for that. But this code right here is super vulnerable. I'm running, I'm building up a script for SQL that selects an email from the users and the ever so dangerous where clause, where username is equal to that username I expect them to have typed. Now, from your knowledge so far, I think we've talked about SQL scripts. What can I put in that username field that may cause this script to fail or to do something nasty to me or do something unexpected? What's the key to what I can do in typing my username? Well, uh, you could you could log in just by adding the password as SQL to or one equals one, or you could potentially you could just end it and uh, you could potentially put like just for the variable you dollar sign name you could just put or you name you mm -hmm. could just for that variable you could just put the end quotation and then write your own right. query. Yep. Now I actually tried this. Uh, I tried to run another command like drop a table and I found out that SQL has enough protection in defaults that it doesn't let you run multiple scripts on a command unless you set a configuration to allow multiple commands on one on one line. So I, I actually, it was a little harder for me to make the vulnerability. Well, I could do something like you said, of doing something new, dropping a table or inserting stuff into a table. But remember part of being able to do this, you have some idea of what query they're running on the server side. So part of this attack is somehow capturing what actual what the actual script looks like that they're running. One way to do this is if they're, if I know my attack, my uh, the person, the site I'm attacking is using open source code, I could get the open source and know where the query is when I do my, like you said, when I do my login. If I knew the query looks like a certain way, like select username from users where all right, let's see. Select password from users where username equals what they've typed in. And then if I have a password, then it you know prompts me for the password. And then select password. And if I if the password matches uh, what I've just typed in, then I'll say, oh, let them in. So it does require me knowing the script running at the server. So 
in the book, they're kind of vague about it. That's why I kind of wanted to cover this. The book says, oh yeah, you can use uh, procedure calls and sort procedures and you can put this in your where clause. But that all requires some idea of what the what script or what SQL query is actually being constructed from that input. So when they say, well, you can put the add the where one equals one, that assumes that you know something about the script that they're running. That if they if they do get a result, it will show me more in more uh, or let me into the system. And the key here is the query ends when there is a single quote around that input. So typically what they'll do, and that's the, the standard uh, example, is I'll say username, they'll, they'll ask for a username in my, on the form, and I'll put in something like Joe quote semicolon or Joe uh, semicolon and one equals one. By adding that quote in there, and then I think you can do a semicolon to end the command, by putting that quote in there, the quote, the script here will, with my, my quote injected into the input, will cause this quote to be ignored and fool my query into being a different query than I expected. So the key is injecting the single quote into the actual input of username. So what they call, and what, and what is still used, even though the book says you cannot sanitize the input, you still have to work at sanitizing the input. And what they do is, if they have typed in a quote in that, in that variable, name, or actually this should have been uname because that's what the variable name is here. I sanitize uname before I get to this command. I put in username equals and then I filter it and I think I have a, thought I had an example. Here's, here's an example of filtering that input. I say, okay, take what they typed and put it, put it in str, but before I use it, run the filter var on it that sanitizes that string. In the book they say, oh, use start procedures and that'll prevent this. Uh, there are certain start procedures that can take the user input as it was passed as a parameter. So that is not always the case. You still, even if you have a start procedure, you still have to be very careful. Sanitize your input in case they threw in a single quote in there or other characters that change what I intended to use that variable for. So this is the sanitizing your input still has to happen. So even the book says sanitizing input doesn't always work or is not reliable. You still have to do it. But always know there may be ways of getting through the sanitizer. But in, even if you're not using something here, like this is PHP, any other uh, server-side script you don't take what they typed in directly into anything you're building as a query. You filter that for filtering out unexpected strings that may cause your system to crash, or strings that will cause your query to behave differently than you expected. So sanitizing input is the website designer's responsibility and the server-side web script responsibility. Uh, expect your, your input to be to contain attacks. This is also where buffer overflow comes. If they're not properly checking the limits on their input, you should say string equals the first 10 characters of your input, ignoring other characters that they may be putting in there to attempt a buffer overflow. So input validation is still critical. Stored procedures isn't the only answer. That's something that's mentioned in the book. Prepared statements is a similar kind of thing as, san as uh, sanitizing the input. 
it's a little complex to understand and you've got to be familiar with scripts and things so I'm not going to have you memorize that. Just know prepared statements or store procedures don't always prevent it. You always still have to check your user input. Assume they're trying to type something bad in there. Something huge to overflow a buffer or strange uh, characters to try to either crash or misdirect your processing on the server side. We'll do more of this and uh, spend more time on the risk assessment part. Is it worth when, how much, dis how do we decide how much time to spend preventing this? All right, cool. see ya. And I'll upload this recording for our friend, Stephen.